Please say hello to Jonah Hill. Thank you for that lovely intro, Brian. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for staying. I know it wasn't the shortest. Uh, yeah. So, no. This chair is really. Um, it's 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 a challenge, isn't it? I'm you want to stand. stand? Let's just stand. stand. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's do a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, or through the, oh, just like the movie. Kurt Cobain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jordan, you've been on a on a wild tour with this. Uh, you know, a lot of people realize that that when you you make a movie and there's all the production entity to it. But then comes a whole nother segment of a related issue, and that's selling your movie. Going out on the road, traveling uh, you know, on, on infinitum, to different places around the world to promote the movie. And I found it to be probably the, the least uh, popular as far as what, you know, my personal experience. I don't, I don't like promoting it as much as I, I, I enjoy making movies and things, but how did you find that? Was it? I mean, that's a challenge, isn't it? Well, I, it, it sometimes can feel that way, but for this film in particular, just because of how excited I am to be a part of it and how proud I am of it, and to be in, you know, with Leo and, and Martin yeah. Scorsese and stuff, and that it's uh, a bit louder. Oh, louder! Sorry. Oh, there we go. I said uh, with this film in particular, it has not. It has been a joy to go around and talk about and. Uh, because of uh, the people I got to work with in the film and how proud I am to be a part of the movie. But uh, I don't know, this kind of thing is the best where you get to meet people who just watched it and, and talk to them about what, you know, what it was like making it. Yeah, no, I didn't mean you. I didn't mean that. Yes, he I meant mean, that this is uh, such no, a chore. No, no. Uh, <laughs> no that's not what he meant at all. He, he meant like doing all the interviews oh, and stuff like interviews. that. And the, and the same questions all the time, but this yeah. audience will ask you questions you've never heard before. Exactly, <laughs> brand new ones. The first question I have is how did, I heard that you auditioned for this role, and, mm -hmm. and you're a big movie star now. Did you have to audition for this role? Was um, it offered to you, or did you? No, it was not, it was not offered to me. Um, Martin Scorsese is my, my favorite filmmaker, or my favorite artist of any medium, form, or anything. So Goodfellas is the reason I want to make movies in the first place. And, uh, when Moneyball had come out, and that's where we, we got to meet at the Golden Globes, my little sister, yeah. I was telling you about, she loved Brian, as did I, and uh, uh, I got nominated for an Oscar, and, and the first phone call we got after that was from Ellen Lewis, uh, Scorsese's casting director, saying, Jonah's at the very bottom of a, of a list <laughs> with way uh, more prestigious <laughs> actors to play Donnie, Diamond Donnie Azoff in, uh, in, in, for Scorsese with Leo, and they have to say you're at the very bottom. Of the list. <laughs> well, they say you're on the list at some degree, but, but I like I like being at the bottom because then you have to fight your way to you know to get what you what you're trying to get you know and uh, it was good because I was so intimidated I, and, and they said you can meet with they're you're gonna fly out to New York and meet Martin Scorsese and you're gonna talk to him about the character so I read the book a few times and the screenplay by Terrence Winter who wrote a lot of the Sopranos and created Boardwalk Empire brilliant guy and. Uh, the only problem was I hadn't been on an audition in six years. So I would have been terrified to go audition for the first time in six years for anybody, let alone Martin Scorsese. And so I'm um, skipping, I said, you know, they're gonna go meet with them so you can go talk about it. And I said, well, I, instead of just, everyone's probably going in there and begging him to play the part, I'm just gonna show him what I would do. And then if that's what he wants, then I'll get the part. And if not, I got to meet my hero and that's great. So. I practiced for like two months and I was terrified and I went in there and uh, we were in a screening room. He has a screening room in his office in New York and uh, it was about 100 degrees in there and it was Scorsese and Ellen Lewis, the casting director, and there was a ladder up to the roof and I realized the AC was busted and so I was like started sweating because I was so nervous and it was so hot and so I went in the bathroom. And Always I, a good impression. Always. Yeah, just... Nice to meet you, I'm, I'm sweating in it. And I went to the bathroom, I was like, get it together, get it together, you know, you're gonna blow it. And then I went back in, I said, I know this is a bizarre request, but is there anywhere else we could possibly do this because it's so hot in here? And he immediately went, you're right, it's so hot in here, let's get out of here, let's get out of here. And we went in his office and we, we, we auditioned and we talked for like two hours and I walked home, I walked 
downtown from uptown in New York, and I was just like, well, that was the coolest experience of my life, and if that is all that comes of this, I'm the luckiest guy. I got to sit and talk to Martin Scorsese for two hours. How cool. That's and then how uh, soon after that did you get a call to say, yeah, we'd like you to do that role? Two months. Ooh. So I was So they had to go through the rest more. of the list, you know. Yeah, they had to like, <laughs> they had to, yeah, meet with all the better actors and then, um, but, I got to meet with Leonardo DiCaprio before that because he's produ he produced the film and he owned the rights to the book. And we were in Mexico promoting a film at the same time and I sat with him and I basically was like, I have to play this character. <coughs> like, there's no one else who can play this character. And you know, as an actor, uh, if you're lucky once in your life, you get to read something and go, I have to play this. And then if you actually do get to end up playing it, it's the greatest feeling in the entire world. And I think Leo being an actor, understood that passion for this and he put in you know he was really supportive and he's the one who called me two months later my phone rang i was at dinner and uh he's like hey i just talked to scorsese and you, you got the part and i ran around screaming i was in new orleans and i just like was running around the streets and then i was like oh, after like 10 minutes of screaming i was like oh yeah thanks and very clever of you <laughs> very clever of you to talk to the star while you're on a junket for another movie. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was like, let's go, can I, can I buy you a drink? You know? I was just like, let me, but yeah, I was, it was true. You know, I'm sure you've had this, it, it just, I've been really lucky because it's happened a few times like with Cyrus or, or, or Moneyball or Superbad, or those are the things where I read and I go, I have to yeah. do this. And that's, you're lucky if that happens once and I've been lucky it's happened a couple times. You know? Now this, this is, uh, this, uncovers the seedy underbelly of, of uh, capitalism. And, uh, it, and as I mentioned to the, to the audience before we started, and Martin doesn't hold anything back. He goes right for the jugular. Yeah, at uh, 71. At 71, he's um, on. On the set, uh, was there as much fun shooting this movie as it seemed to be when you were, you know, it's, it's the, this absolutely this bacchanal going on in the movie and around the movie? Well, I, 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 would, I think it, it was interesting because I didn't, that's not my personal idea of fun, you know? So, uh, you know, all, it, it, to me, it, we were actually just talking about this uh, before we got here, but it, it was so fascinating because the thing about Donnie that I hated the most was that he didn't treat people nicely. He was like mean to people and, and you know, the kid with the fishbowl and he yeah. throws a cigarette at him and makes him cry and all this stuff and it's like, it's so ugly. So you were there and you, I was so engaged with working with, <clears throat> with two of my heroes and doing the work, but on the drive home every night I would feel so guilty for all the stuff I had done during the day. Seriously, because I would just be like, you know, have to speak people so badly, the way they treated women, the way they, they only cared about money, it just was a, it, it was like energetic and crazy and you were wrapped up in it while you were there and it was all like adrenaline for six months. But then when you go home, you have to kind of understand that, okay, I have to leave that there and you know, and so feel with, guilt sometimes. So with a character like that, that is repugnant on many levels. What then, when you were reading the script, drew you into wanting and needing to do that role? Well, basically what I said to Leo and then Martin Scorsese when I met them was that I, I recognize who this person is in society and I think there are a lot of what's wrong with society and it'd be, so, it'd be such a challenge and so interesting to try and bring that person to life and also bring some things that are human about that kind of person. Because on paper, he's pretty evil. You know, he, he, the way he talks about his wife and his kids and he cheats and he does drugs and he steals from people and all of this stuff. But then there's an interesting thing where, where, where you have an opportunity to show that that's also a human being who's also making some really bad choices and in a really bad place in his life. Like who knows what Donnie's like now. You know, if Donnie is still alive. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but it's it's interesting. It's it's interesting snapshot of of what these guys. You know, if you're given that opportunity, and do you do you take a bite of the apple and, and uh, you know, Garden of Eden? It's like these, yeah. The 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 character character is developed in in people by the choices they make under 
under stress and conditions like mm -hmm. this. And these people made those decisions. Greed and avarice and hubris came into play. And it snowballed. And it snowballs. Yeah. And they, they get addicted to the power of it and they can't stop it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, contributed to the, the drug uh, addiction as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, I, when I, I took away from this is that I, it was, it blew me back in the seat and I left the theater and I was like, a little dizzy, and oh my God, what did I just witness? <laughs> I feel like I either want to smoke a cigarette or take a shower. <laughs> or smoke crack. Or smoke crack, do something, <laughs> something crazy. Um, but, you know, after reflection and going away and talking with friends about it, it really became a cautionary tale to me. It was like, wow, I could see that. When the business is uh, the business of making money, the business of creating business for your own personal gain, um, it's it, it is it is tempting, and 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 all human beings are susceptible to temptation. Maybe not this specific temptation, right. but there is something that is tempting to every single person. Well, the way and I so you can relate. From that. Well, the way I sorry to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to, but I, I think you know I I own this theater. I know. I know. I know. I, I know. I know. Oh, my God. I'll, uh, I'm so sorry, Mr. President. Uh, I want to pontificate. I know. Sh I'm sorry. I, I realized I got excited about something you were saying. And I will shut your mic off like that. Yeah. <laughs> he can make me disappear like Oz in here. It's, uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, truly, what I meant to say was that I think there's part of there's a part of any human being that wants to be rich and wants the most and wants the best in their ego and everything. And Donnie's like a hundred, like hopefully in a normal person, that's like one and a half percent of who they are, and you suppress it with all these other great things about yourself. And with Donnie, he's a hundred percent that, you know. And that was interesting. Yeah. Uh, the physical transformation that you did really was such a stark visual for me. Well, thanks. I mean, that, that was in the script, in Terrence Winter's script. Uh, there, Donnie had because they talk about it in the voiceover where he has these big veneers, like these blinding white phosphorescent teeth. And that was that was in there from, from, from the get-go. So uh, we knew that. And then um, the hair, uh, I, like, I just kind of, you know, uh, it was so great because, I mean, not to talk, I mean, I can't say enough about working with Martin Scorsese himself, is that when, when he, you're working on one of, him, one of his films, myself excluded, Everyone is the best at what they do in, in the world. So, you know, you collaborate on a level that I've never collaborated before. Like Sandy Powell, our Academy Award winning costume designer. Like we had months of fittings where we talked about Donnie, you know, about character and why he dressed the way he did. You know, his ridiculous sweater. Like he tried to look waspy and upper crust even though he was, you know, a lower middle class guy selling children's furniture in yeah. Bayside, Queens. You know, so it's... It's about looking like you're the best. And like, even though it looks ridiculous on him because it's so not, it's a veneer. Yeah. And then he's wearing literal veneers. veneers, yeah. And then we wanted his hair to be like, like blonder and like, I always thought of it like a, like a lit match. You know, like, cause, cause he's just so like weird and, and chaotic and, and I just, you look at him and you immediately are like, oh, that, that guy has a lot of problems and he's in trouble, you know? <laughs> you know? But he's also trying to look rich and waspy and, you know, it's so absurd. It's, these guys live so absurdly, you know? It is, and, and, but I, I found myself laughing. So it is a comedy and I'm enjoying the, the, the humor of it, right. the deprived humor about it. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you about when you had such an, um, an um, that you looked at, at uh, Martin as such an idol of yours, mm -hmm. did it present any any um, hurdles on on the job? Did you feel apprehensive if you're going into a job you're, and you're really on the same par and, and clicking with a director? Mm -hmm. It's one thing that you could feel comfortable. Did you feel initially uncomfortable working with such an icon? I, I think it's a great question because there could not be a situation that I could have ever walked into in my life where I would be more intimidated than, than this one, yeah. you know? So, but what I know about myself is I work better when I feel like everyone else there is better than I am. 
so I work better. Like I said, I like to start at the bottom or you know, be on the bottom of the list, as I think it's, it, it forces you to elevate and learn as you're going. And you really, I work better when I'm, my desire is to impress the person or the director. So, you know, Bennett Miller and Brad Pitt and, and Moneyball with Phil Hoffman, Phil Seymour Hoffman yeah. there, I was terrified and I felt um, not confident, but that I had to earn my place at the table. And so, uh, same with this was I felt comp in the grandest sense, like before I shot my first scene, I was, I mean, I was a mess, you know? I was in my trailer like pacing and freaking out. And Mr. Hill. Mr. Yeah. Hill, well, well, we need you. Yeah, and, I, I, and it's true, but I think that that does elevate you in some way because you're forced to earn, you feel, at least I feel personally, like you need to earn your seat at that table and it, and it, it makes you do better work, I think. And actually, I have a good story real quick from the first day was I was so nervous and um, uh, I had been doing this Long Island accent, but I hadn't been doing this really raspy voice and I had been thinking about it, but I didn't do it during the two months of rehearsals. And so I hadn't shown it to anyone. And so I was like, I really want to do this voice. I think it's gonna be great for Donnie, but I hadn't shown like Scorsese or anyone or done it ever for anybody. And so um, Spike Jones was there the first day that I was shooting and it was the first day of the shoot. And uh, uh, Spike was in Moneyball. So we were friend friendly and I, and he's a great director. He directed her this year and in a lot of great films. And uh, uh, I was like in the makeup room and I was like, Spike, like I haven't done this voice. Can I show you? Because he's a director. So I was like, can I show you this voice? And I'm like, I haven't shown it to anyone. And he's like, yeah, and I did the voice. And he's like, oh, definitely do that. And so the first take, I just did it and Scorsese never said anything. So I just kept doing it for the next six months. And like four months in, he one take, uh, he, it was when the diner scene where you first meet me, yeah. we Donnie, when he's like, is that your car, you know? And the, like that was like four months into shooting and Scorsese's like, that was a little too raspy. But he had never mentioned that I was doing it the entire time. So I was like, I just did it. And then I figured he would tell me not to if he li didn't like it. And, we never spoke about it ever, so. No one speaks faster than Martin Sorsky. Yes, yeah. Maybe he said it and I just missed it. What is so fast? It was a recipe. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Um, uh, welcome to Palm Springs. Thank you. Sam Variety uh, honored you this morning, so mm -hmm. congratulations. Thanks. Um, I always like to know about dreams and you know, the dreams, your personal dreams. And with Moneyball, you really you became an Oscar nominee and you really went up a, a level, and um, now you're getting Oscar buzz again. So have you met your dreams? Have you surpassed your dreams? And if so, what, what, what are your new dreams? Um, that's a good question. Her question was mostly focused on dreams and... Uh, I'm the owner, I'll, I'll oh, repeat okay, the question. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'll just wait in the car. <laughs> Sorry, I think that's your job. Question was about his dreams, and did he meet his dreams? And, uh, <laughs> no, you said it so much better. You said it so much better. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, you really did say it so much better. Though. About the dreams, um, the meeting his dreams. What she was saying was, is that... Uh, <laughs> no, so she was, uh, okay, she was talking about dreams and my dreams and, and if, uh, oh, so you forgot. Yeah, 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 I forgot. Yeah. That's why you can't do that uh, part. No, I'm not good at this. Right. Um, did you meet your dreams? And in Moneyball, he was nominated for an Oscar, and now I was just feted last night uh, at, at the uh, film festival, and now there's Oscar buzz for this. And have you met your dreams? Have you, that's the question. Dreams. Dreams. Like I originally said. I just want to point. I just want to point that out. But it just seemed like a long explanation to say what that. <laughs> He's the boss. He's the boss. Um, no, I mean, yeah, of course, I've surpassed any dream I ever had. You know, I, I would have. You know, Goodfellas was my is the movie that made me want to make movies in the first place. It's my all time favorite film. And the Oscar stuff is amazing. It's cool, like when someone says that when before you walk out somewhere or something. You know, it sounds really great, and it's an honor, a complete honor. But 
uh, what it really did was it allowed Martin Scorsese to know that I was a person that existed in the world and that I was an actor. And to me, it's all about like what work you get to do and who you get to work with and be around. So for me, the, the, the Oscar stuff was so great for many reasons. I got to give my mom a wonderful night. I got to take her to the Oscars and you know, uh, my sister to the Golden Globes and got it to meet Brian and, and uh, you know, uh, but truly what it did was it, it, it allowed me an opportunity like this, you know, so all that stuff is, it's so nice and great, but it, it is what it is, but with the true gift of all of it and your dreams are just to keep working with better people and people you admire, you know. You notice in the, the first uh, thing you said about wanting, reading scripts and, and having to do a role, nowhere in there is a sentence, and this will get me noticed come award season, and this will get me this. It's not about that. It has to be from an organic place where, as an artist, you respond to the material. It resonates within you, the character. You can relate to it, and you, you have a drive and a desire to do that. Whatever happens beyond that is and always should be a tap on the shoulders, and you turn around and someone says, hey, we, want, we nominated you, and it's like, oh, great, that's fantastic. But truly successful, artists of any uh, realm, I think pursue the art form and not the trappings that could be behind that. If you see, if, if I'm always leery if someone says, I'm uh, a filmmaker, so I'm gonna make a classic. I'm gonna out to make a <laughs> classic movie. And I'm like, oh, you're in trouble because you can't. Yeah. Only, only the fans of that movie can make a classic movie. The years go by and you look back, does it hold up, does it resonate still? Then it's the, it's the people that will make that. And I think it's the same point of view with, uh, with actors. Now you mentioned something about opening up opportunities. Um, in 21 Jump Street and now 22 Jump Street, you got a lot of Jump Streets to go, by the way. You can go forever. 38 Jump, 38 jump Street. Jump Street. <laughs> 114 Jump Street. <laughs> um, but you, you wrote it. Yes. And produced it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Was, in addition to acting, was this always a, a, a dream of yours, a pursuit to one day do that, or, or did you discover it during this whole process? No, I, you know, I, I always just, I love movies. I do this because I, like, I'm going to go home tonight, and I'm going to watch, like, three movies <laughs> with my friends, you know? It's like, it, I... Like you guys are all here because you love movies. It's like the same thing, you know. So, I just when I was starting out, I was on these sets, and I would uh, uh, I was very lucky to have people that were very open about the process of movie making. You know, when I started out, I'm 30 now. I started when I was 18, and the first few movies I worked with with David O. Russell was the first director I worked with, and then you know Judd Apatow and 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 Greg Mottola and, and a bunch of people, Seth and Evan. Um, these people who were not only really talented, but incredibly open with like, here's what we're doing, here's how we did this, come to the table read and let's all give notes on what it is. And then, you know, so I was just fascinated by that. And I just like would always write at the same time. I also, you know, before Cyrus and, and Moneyball and stuff like that, I didn't think I'd ever get the opportunity to be in more dramatic type of movies, which also reflect my taste just as much as comedy does, you know? so. In my head, I was like, well, I should know how, I should learn how to, I should have to write my own film because I don't know if I'll ever get to be cast in, in, in another kind of film, you know? So I started and then uh, uh, Superbad came out and my agent called me and she said, would you want to turn 21 Jump Street, the 80s TV show, into a movie? And I was like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then I thought about it, thought about it, and I said, okay, well, if I can make like a John Hughes movie meets Bad Boy. I was 23 at the time, so this was a lot more where my taste was. A seasoned down. veteran. Because you want to see, well, I want to see John Hughes meets Bad Boys. Okay, that would be great. Um, and then can I completely make fun of the fact that we're being unoriginal and recycling an idea? And can we make fun of ourselves and be aware of that? And they said, sure. And so that's what we did. And we really killed ourselves to make sure we were aware and making fun of ourselves for doing what we were doing at every turn. And then in the second one, um, the whole joke is like, you know, uh, 
basically second missions are always worse and more expensive than first missions. And so like basically that sequels are bigger and worse than than the first movie. So when is that coming out? That comes out in June. But the whole thing about that stuff is just self awareness for when you're you know, the, sec the segment's about self-awareness of making a sequel, that it's ridiculous. Okay, yeah. so it took you a couple years from 18 to 23 to become a writer-producer. How many years from 30 to whenever to be a director of a feature? Um, I don't know. I, I, really do, I really do have a passion for directing, and, and right now I'm getting to work with all my heroes, you know? Like, so I, I'm, I wanna keep, I have such a love for acting. I love it so much, and like we said, okay, so you know, we were talking about if you read something and you have to play the part, right? No other actor can play this part. Now it's my goal to only act in things where I say I have to play yeah. this part. That That's would be exactly. my new dream. That would be my new dream. So instead of working in between that, yes. only doing the things where I go, I have to do this, no yeah. one else can do that. And as a director, I have to wait till there's a story where I say, I have to tell this story. I think that's a good criteria. I really that, do. That Otherwise, you'd be, it, for, especially for actors coming up, we, we, you get offered a job, yes. Well, what about this? Yes. And you have right. bills to pay, and, and at a certain and point. Terror, inner terror and of never working I'm again. never going to work again. Because when you're starting out, it's just all like, please, God, let me get a job, you know? <laughs> and it's hard then to, say, to learn how to say no. Mm -hmm. Yes? Question is, do you have, uh, not specifically to theater or theatrical? I mean, uh, you started as an 18-year-old. Well, he didn't start as an 18-year-old, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear. Did you, in your childhood, did you perform in schools and things like that? What's your theatrical background? Uh, no, my parents aren't actors. My dad's an accountant, and my mom uh, is a Renaissance woman. Has started completely many and completely different businesses throughout my life, and having her three kids. So she's a very inspiring. Uh, well, both of them are very inspiring. But uh, did you do high school? no, I didn't. I I thought it. I really, um, I really was not good at anything in high school. I was well liked. Like I had a great time. And the idea of going to do a play sounded so ridiculous to me. So much so that when I went to, um, they asked me to talk to my acting program in my high school in, uh, in Los Angeles where I grew up. And I had never been in the, the building before so I had to ask them where it was because I had never <laughs> been inside. And when I was 18, I went to new school in New York and I said, it was great school, great school. And, uh, and I started writing and writing plays and because I was interested in movies and there wasn't a movie, there wasn't a film school there, but they had playwriting. So I go, okay, I can write one act plays, that'll be great. And when I would cast the plays, I really didn't know how to talk to the actors. I would just get really frustrated that they weren't doing it how I wanted, which is the worst thing a director can be. So a friend suggested, why don't you take an acting class in order to know what you would like to hear as an actor, which was great advice from a friend of mine. And so I took an acting class when I was 18 at New School in the acting program, and I was like, this is it. This is great. That's a good story. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I loved you in this role. And, and Thanks. And I really loved the end, you know, it was terrific. How's your relationship with Don Lemon these days? <laughs> Don Lemon? <laughs> I only met him one time, and I, I don't have any relationship with him. I wish him all the best. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, you have uh, had some success in film comedy. Do you find as an actor one that you gravitate towards more, you find more difficult? Had success in both comedy and drama. Uh, what's his preference? And is anyone more difficult than the other? No, I, th I think it's really interesting. I feel really lucky that I get to go back and forth. And the idea, I guess, would be to mix the two really deeply. You know, um, uh, I get asked that question quite a bit. And with comedies for me is I started out making funny movies and I loved making them, I do love them. And, uh, but that's what I would get like all the time and I was so scared to stop working or like I just was like, okay, I'll go do this and do this. And then I've gotten to play characters that ended up being more complex and gotten to try all these wonderful new things. 
And now I'm trying to figure out what the ideal is. What I love about Scorsese and, and this film is that within the same, not only within the same film, but a lot of times within the same scene or the same minute, things can go from being heavy, dramatic, to funny, to dark, to all of these different types of things, which is what life is like and in, in a lot of circumstances, not just one. You know, you never have a day where you go, I was funny from the moment I woke up <laughs> till the moment I went to sleep. You know, it's like maybe there are some moments of certain, certain that have certain pathos to them, you know, but that's what I aim for is I, I ultimately would like to do things that feel like life. I, I watch documentaries constantly. The things that appeal to me the most are human feelings and why people do the things they do. Yes. Uh, the question is, did you catch Jordan Belfort's name in the credits, and did you actually meet him? Yes, he was in the movie. He was, at the very end of the movie, he was the guy announcing the fictitious Jordan Belfort. That's Jordan Belfort. And improvised his own line, which was, I've met uh, rock stars, gangsters, but this is the most badass person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> He's talking about himself. So, yeah. And, and Jordan was the biggest asset I've ever had on, on a film because, uh, oh, hey, Michelle. Hi. Oh, sorry, I thought you were my friend Michelle. Sorry, that's not you. Sorry. He does that occasionally. <laughs> occasionally sorry. he just goes on. Where am I? Um, no. You were saying that no, Jordan so Beffert was the biggest asshole on no, the set. No, <laughs> Jordan, Jordan was amazing because, I mean, how rarely do you play a character where you could call them literally like in between takes and go, so when this was going down, what was this actually like? And yeah. he was, you know, he has his many flaws, he has a very flawed past, but he is the most open person I've ever met and did not withhold any um, truth to his past, no matter how ugly it was, you know? And so um, I've never had anything like that where someone was willing to go so personal with who they were. Right so often and Leo and I would go to dinner with him and sit and ask him questions and he's just, you know, the thing about him is is that you don't really know, you know, he, he, he has reformed his life and he seems very guilty about what he had done and feel guilty, but he's, he brings you in, you know, he's a salesman. He, 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 you sit there at dinner with him and you're like, this is the most entertaining guy I've ever met in my life, you know? and I. And, you know, you're, I'm around actors and stuff. And he's just one of those guys who tells a story and everyone is listening. I had this, we went to dinner one time and I saw the tennis player, Serena Williams, who was so nice. And I walked by her and she was like, hey, and we were talking and we, we you know, uh, we were conversing. And then I just felt Jordan creep up over my shoulder and was like, hey, Jordan Belfort, they're making a movie about my life. Like, Joan is playing this, and Leonardo DiCaprio is playing me. And he started going, and I could see her, because she's, you know, incredibly famous, talented person, that people must do this kind of thing to her all the time. And I saw that she was like, okay, here it comes, like some guy's talking to me. And by three minutes in, she wouldn't have stopped the conversation. She loved, like, you just, she, he just talked and talked and talked, and eventually you're like, I can't stop listening to this guy, you know? <laughs> Is it? Yeah, he has that uh, hypnotic uh, ability. And, uh, and I, I, I've seen some uh, YouTube things on him, and, and then Leo captured him just like Beautifully. that essence. Was Leo, I think this is Leo's finest performance. I think he's on he, He's such, he's such a gifted. It looks like, it looks, you guys must have gotten hurt throughout the movie, right? I mean, were you going to ask that? Because they're tumbling and running and grabbing and falling. And I mean, did you, were there some, you know, bumps and bruises and well, any lacerations or anything like that? Yes. Uh, Leo is, is the best actor of his generation. I think he's so brilliant. Uh, he is incredibly rough physically, though, and he's bigger and stronger than I am. So. Um, in those scenes, I still have phantom pain when I think about it. <laughs> in the scene when I ask him to go, you know, when Donnie says, come smoke crack with me, and they go smoke crack, and Leo and Jordan goes, 
you know, let's run like lions, bless you, run like lions and tigers and bears. And he smacks my back, he smacks my back. We did it like 50 times. And it hurts so badly every time that literally when I think about it, I get like a pain and I like, it, 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 it's a horrible feeling. And the, the lewd sequence, and when I'm choking and he's pounding my chest, and he's like, you know, he's so, it was great. Everyone got to be so, it was so real. It felt like it was happening, but a lot of the fighting and, and stuff like that. You could have broken a rib. I got punched in the face, for real. Um, this is an interesting story by John Barenthal, who plays Brad, who's incredible. He's an incredible actor. Um, he plays my enemy in the film, the drug dealer that I keep getting into uh, fights with. Great actor named John Barenthal. So we're shooting that scene on the roof where I come out and I go, you know, you're just a pill dealer. I have, you know, I'm the reason we have all this money, and he's supposed to hit me in the face. And um, we do it a few times, and Scorsese's like, ah, doesn't look good, doesn't look good, doesn't look good. And then that's like the worst feeling for me in the yeah. entire world because all I want to do is please this this person, you know. And we're sitting there, and we're on this little couch in the room where we shot the scene where we're taping the money on it, right. which is right next door. And there's this little couch, and Martin Scorsese's here, and Leo's here, and John Barenthal's getting into character, hating me by pacing back and forth, like, you know, and he's really buff and everything. And um, he's like, it doesn't look real. And then he's like, and he turns to me and goes, Kit, you want to try one where he hits you for real? And I've never. Yes, Mr. Scorsese. Yes, yes I do. I, yes. I have never and will never say no to a request of his, but I was just quiet because I was just hoping like maybe someone would jump in or like a producer or someone would jump in. So I just, <laughs> I'll send you the dental. Wow. Good story. Yes, yeah, so way in the back. Thank you again for being here today. Sure you oh, my pleasure. <laughs> what? Do you have a question for Jonah? Thanks. So yeah, the question was uh, <laughs> the question was about uh, how to portray being on drugs and what that process was like of um, acting, you know, like you're on drugs. Uh, speaking of an injury that has to do with that, that connects to that. Another thing is I got bronchitis for a month and a half horribly because the cocaine that we snorted was vitamin B, and I had snorted so much vitamin B that my lungs had gotten infected with bronchitis, and I was sick for a month and a half. And because all day, for six months, you're just snorting that powder, and yeah. it's good for you, it's vitamins, but that much matter in your lungs is like really bad for you. So anyway, um, we had uh, Emma, uh, Emma, our producer, who's amazing, who's, pro who's Scorsese's producing partner, uh, Emma Koskoff, Tillinger Koskoff, and she, uh, she had arranged for a drug, a drug consultant, a drug expert, to meet with me a few times before we started <laughs> shooting. So I, and I sat with this woman in a room a few times and just was like, walk me through what smoking crack feels like. You know, walk me through all of this. And she walked me through everything. And what seems, uh, quaaludes are before my generation, so anyone my age hasn't, uh, I'm 30, anyone my age hasn't tried one. Um, and so I couldn't really, I just had to ask people, you know, tons and tons of people what it was like that were from a generation before me, and what seems to be the... Oh, say? I'm looking at you. Yeah, Brian. <laughs> no, I'm trying to be so innocent. There was some takers out there, yeah. I know. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the unanimous comment from every person who had ever tried one was, they'd say, oh, this is what it felt like, and she told me lots of things like your finger, you lose your motor skills, and your finger feels like it could weigh 10 pounds, and so... I imagined like a tiny version of myself like puppeteering a bunch of dead weight during that quaalude sequence. And, but every single person I asked, they go, here's what it feels like, it goes like this, and then there's the stages and everything. And every single one of them, every single person I asked at some point in the conversation would go, God damn, they were fun. <laughs> like everyone was seemed so upset that they were no longer in, in existence anymore. Like every single people you would not think seemed to be so upset that they were no longer a part really of well it. Really well done. It really, I really thought you had loads of experience in, in the drug world. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Okay, the film was amazing, but 
Thanks. question was uh, in, in improvisation as opposed to scripted material and how much was it in any specific scenes, namely uh, when Rob Reiner came in talking about the budget? Yes. Uh, the, uh, supposedly, from what Emma, the Scorsese producer, told me that this was his most improvised film, Scorsese, so that was really exciting uh, for me as an actor. As Brian knows, just when you get the opportunity to, you know, Terrence Winter wrote it, who's one of my, actually one of my favorite writers, not just like lying and saying that he's actually one of my favorite writers wrote an amazing script, but as an actor, when you're playing a character, it's you really find out who the person is when you get to go outside of or what you already know. So if you don't know something and someone throws something at you or you throw something at someone else, then you're really getting to fi figure out how this person reacts in, in, in real time, you know? And I love it. I love that part of it so much. Like with Rob Reiner, it was so great to do that with, and John Barenthal and, and Leo, who is an amazing improviser and, uh, you know, so many of those like moments, you know, came from just exploring different angles that weren't there. Like where I'm talking about dropping my kids off in the woods, you know, uh, and, like, you know, all that stuff was horrible. It was written as that, uh, you know, he, I would take them to an institution or whatever, right? And so I thought it'd be interesting for Donnie's version of a joke would be that I'm gonna let them run free in the woods. And then he goes, no, no, but seriously, I would take them to an institution, which is, which is so messed up, which is so, you know, he was saying, no, but, but seriously, I would do the right thing. I would, you know, you know, yeah, which I found to be, you know, just things, or the, uh, the club where the, the butler is saying, you know, do you, you know who uh, Pepe is, or I forgot the person, and I go, and he goes, you know the lollipop club, and I go, yeah, I get fucked up, I like to dance, you know, like, <laughs> like, there's just things that give things texture and build, you know, more to a character than is already there, and it was, all these actors are the greatest actors, it was so great to do with them. Uh, yes. Uh, favorite movie is um, uh, Goodfellas, and this young lady's favorite movie is Carlito's Way, and the, the uh, Sean Penn character in Carlito's Way reminded her of Donnie in this movie, and, and were there any uh, prototypes or characters that you looked at? That's a very, I mean, that's a very astute observation. Uh, I love Carlito's Way, I love Sean Penn's performance in it. Uh, David Kleinfeld, <laughs> you know, the uh, scumbag. Cokehead lawyer. Oh, sorry. Uh, scumbag cokehead lawyer is what I said. Um, I love Sean Penn's performance in Carlito's Way. And yeah, you know, I, I, I didn't base it on him or anything, but I love that performance. And to me, it was more. Um, Who did you steal from then? <laughs> you, Brian. Obviously. All, just everything you've done. Um, no, I uh, just. It, was, it wasn't a character from a movie. To me, I like to really go for people I've witnessed in real life. That to me is, you know, there's actors who's, whose work I, you know, flip out for and just love and love and obviously I'm probably like sub subliminally influenced by just having watched their movies a thousand times. But uh, to me, this was, these were people, my parents um, are from Long Island and I just gone around there and visited relatives and stuff. and. And not necessarily people like this exactly, but just that, you know, um, the attitude for me was like the, the core of it is, is like Peter Brand in Moneyball. He was a guy, the guy played in Moneyball, he, he didn't feel he deserved to ever be in a conversation. So he never made eye contact with anybody. You know, he would always look away and didn't feel like he deserved to be there ever. And Donnie feels like entitled to be anywhere and that he owns any room that he's in. And that's what I, the vibe I would get from these people I would meet growing up where I'm from California and I'd be a little more like res reserved or anything. But these guys at, I would meet at summer camp or something, you know, on the East Coast would come up to me and be like, hey bro, how you doing? And like look right at you and like feel very entitled to your space and your, you know, and that's what Donnie is. He feels entitled, you know, even with, with Jordan in the first scene, he, he, he doesn't, he feels entitled to walk up to someone eating breakfast and ask how much money they make and be in their personal space. And 
that to me was more like just the attitude of, of what this guy was. You know? So, did you did you eat the goldfish? I I tried to eat the goldfish. Um, we tried to do besides the drugs, everything be you know as as authentic as possible. And I said, well, this guy ate a goldfish, so. Maybe it'll feel more real if I eat, actually, eat it. the reaction will be from everyone in the room will be better. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And they, PETA said, no way. And this was a carnival goldfish, okay? And there were three adult human beings handling the goldfish. Three paid, the goldfish had three assistants. And All with earpieces. Yeah. The goldfish is on the move, goldfish is on the move. Right this way, Mr. Goldfish. The goldfish needs Evian water, not this Dasani water. The hell? This goldfish will not work for that. It's true. The goldfish is treated nicer than, than I was. I, I, uh, I, uh, and so they said you can put the goldfish in your mouth for three seconds at a time and then you have to spit it back into water. So um, Scorsese did this specialty shot, which is in the film, where it's like from above, this cool thing. And, and we put it in my mouth and we did about four or five takes. The first take, I'm not kidding, I put the goldfish in my mouth and it immediately goes to the bathroom in my mouth. <laughs> I swear. And it was one of the more disgusting... Number one or number two? Uh, I don't even want to speculate yet. Yeah. All the same. It was just so grossed out, and I spit it in the water, and then it, it was, uh, it, it, it was gross. Okay, we're well, gonna do that again. Right, kid, kid, we're gonna do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just, uh, he's like, I'm gonna tell the goldfish to go to the bathroom in your mouth. Uh, uh, <laughs> he was directed. Wow. Yes, sir. Or maybe the goldfish was so nervous to work with Scorsese so that nervous. <laughs> Pee all over himself. <laughs> oh my God, I'm going into a mouth. <laughs> Scared. That's all. Yes, sir. Gentlemen said, "Bringing back the best show of all time." I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. John, I love your work, and I found I'm still feeling troubled with the disparity between the farcical nature of the film and the truly tragic, painful human element of what it's addressing. And I'm curious. You must have thought deeply about this, or what Scorsese's thoughts, or the decision to present this, this painful subject matter in such. An almost SNL skit type presentation at times, which was great fun, but I also felt the disparity around this actually happens to people and it's, it's, it ruins their lives. Mm -hmm. so I was just curious what the decision process was to present it that way. Well, I'll, I'll, so I'll, his question was that he's having difficulty with with uh, the idea that this is presented the way it is, and is it is it uh, making light of the way these guys acted, even though. They really devastatingly hurt people. I'm curious what the, your thought process was. You, obviously, you must have thought about it. And Scorsese must well, quite a bit, and I and, and I, I can't speak for Terrence Winter or Martin Scorsese and how they approached making their film. But as a part of making the film, what I can say personally is, is that I personally think that what these guys did and the way they were living was was something I completely don't agree with. Specifically. The part about swindling people out of their money and ruining a lot of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so the way it's shown, it's shown as these guys without a care in the world, having the best time ever while doing this. And I look at it as, what's, look what their punishment was for it. And their judicial punishment was, was incredibly, shockingly minimal. And the point, I can't say what Scorsese meant by the point of his film, he's the best director of all time, you can totally ask him. Um, but what I took away from it is not just, what's messed up is that, is that these guys didn't have a lot of consequence and a lot of lives were ruined. But is, if you behave this way and you still get off, do you still win? Are you still a good person? Are you still a hero at the end of the day? And I, I think it'd be a lot harder to live with yourself if you behave this way, even if you got off scot-free, you know? So that's my personal opinion about it. Good point. I think we have uh, time for a couple more, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Yes, sir. Uh, well, just to that point, I mean, a lot of Scorsese's movies are about gangsters. Yeah. Really, they're not pleasant people either, so you see parallels between 
this movie and Goodfellas, perhaps? Yeah, I do. He said so a lot of Scorsese, or some of Scorsese's films are about you know characters that are maybe unsavory, like gangsters and Goodfellas. And uh, Leo and I would talk a lot during this film. And my opinion was, uh, again, speaking to that, was that if you, when I grew up, when I grew up, I was watching Goodfellas, which was my favorite film. And when I saw it when I was way too young, maybe like 10 or 11 years old, and same with Kids, the Larry Clark film, okay? And at that age, I watched it and go, oh, I wanna be a, a gangster, that'd be great, you know? Or with Kids, I was a young skateboarder, and go, I wanna be a skateboarder, and I wanna go live in New York and be a cool skateboarder. But both films, I completely ignored the third act of the film, which is the downfall, which is how it ends horribly for these people. I don't watch Goodfellas or kids or this film and go, I want to be that at the end. It might be really exciting and crazy from some perspective, but the aftermath is, is horrible. You know, that's, that's how I feel. I mean, as far as a, a dramatic component, uh, only bad things make good stories. <laughs> Think about it. If everything goes well in the person's life, that's going to make one of the, the most boring story you could ever think <laughs> Then he graduated from college. Then he married his sweetheart from high school. They had three beautiful kids. He won the lottery. Everybody was healthy. He won the lottery. It was like, <laughs> we need conflict. Conflict drives plot. Without conflict, you can't move a story forward. So that's what you're always looking for is a conflict. And, we're attracted to different things in our in our lives and you know in, in our in our movies, and um, and I think that's what's great about it, is that we, we all sit in here and we, we have different uh, reactions to different scenes and different reactions uh, to the movies themselves, and we're all correct, because however you felt about this movie or any movie, you're right, and that's the the great gift that art provides. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. J.C. Chandor made a movie a couple of years ago called Margin Call, which was really a terrific movie. I agree with you. And uh, did you see it, and did you have a reaction to it? I have not seen Margin Call, so um, I will Down definitely check it out now. And uh, But I heard it's great. And for me, uh, Leo and I spent time with Wall Street guys and stuff, and what I realized really early on was that all the other Wall Street movies and real Wall Street people didn't help with our cause of what we were doing because when we would go to Wall Street and stuff or watch films about you know famous Wall Street films, they were about people who felt like they deserved to be there. They were like almost like like you know uh, Kyle Chandler has a great scene in this where he says most people their fathers and their fathers before them are all douchebags, but you got this way all on your own, <laughs> and these guys got this way all on their own. They weren't from a lineage of people who were cheaters and hustlers. They their own selves brought them to that point. And so I immediately was like, these guys aren't what we're going for. We're going for people who have never seen Wall Street before. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay, we, uh, well, one, two more. How much time do we have, Lindsay? We have to go? Two more, two more. Did you ask a question already? No, okay, yes. That with the chest pounding thing she's asking about, the Matthew McConaughey thing, and then Leo does it at the end of the film. That was Matthew McConaughey's uh, acting warm up exercise. <laughs> and so he was doing that to get into character, and Leo was just like, uh, You guys should roll the camera. And brilliant. he saw it and was like, This is amazing. It's animalistic. It, is, yeah. it, it, it fit the character perfectly. And then Leo and Scorsese had the idea to bring that back later in the film to show that these guys have all turned into loyal army of animals, yeah. basically. Wow. Yeah. That's great. That's a good... Yes? Okay, I have one, but she has a question she wants to ask. Or transferring the question? So if she didn't want to raise her arm, she did it for her? You're nervous. Okay, that's all right. What was it like making the stand? Hmm. How much fun? 
This is the end, a movie uh, that came out this year, didn't it? Yeah, it yeah. came out last summer, yeah. this past summer. This is the end. Um, it was it was a great experience. You know, Seth and Evan, uh, they wrote super bad, and they had called me and said, will you go be in this film and play yourself? And uh, I said, sure, because, you know, that movie gave me my, my start, and I would be there for those guys, and they're brilliant. It was their first movie they were directing. And they said, you're going to play yourself, and they gave me a script, and the script where it was, everyone was really kind of mean, you know? Like everyone was really mean to each other. And I said, I'll do it. I think you guys are brilliant directors, you'll be great. But I want to play myself as the nicest guy ever, <laughs> who then secretly is the meanest guy ever. <laughs> and they were like, okay, it's okay, okay, I'll do it. And then, and then we just, it was a blast. It was a total laugh. That's a great idea. Yes, ma'am, last question. Yeah, well, Donnie's a, a, she asked if Donnie um, got jail time as well. And uh, Donnie's a composite character, but some of the characters uh, that he's based on did get about, you know, three years or so, or maybe two, two three years in, in like a white collar prison. Yeah. I understand. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> is there, did I hear correctly that uh, um, he is donating money from the book and from tours or something that to for recompense of the picture. that's what I read as well I haven't asked him specifically but supposedly Jordan Belfort is giving the profits from the book and the film that he gets as restitution is that the word restitution yeah. Yeah. to the to his victims yeah well there's something anyway maybe it's mandatory I'm not him I'm, I'm just an actor you know? <laughs> I'm getting nervous here when you have one more question one more and we'll, we'll wrap it up yes sir yeah I was just Martin Scorsese. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And I, I think I touched on it earlier, but that I thought it would be really, I saw who this person was and I felt that um, bringing him to life, no matter how many negative qualities, would be a great, exciting challenge. Yeah, it's not necessarily that you have, you, you become a hero in the characters that you see, but did it, did it resonate within you? Was it honest? You know, I mean, knowing where the character is going, it doesn't mean you're going to be held in a in a in high esteem or in a good light. The character certainly had problems. Fun, funny at times, you know, funny to watch. But oof, it was a tough one. Anyway, okay. Oh boy, look at that hand go straight up. I, I already said we already had the last one, but is this a really good question? All right, go ahead. This last one. Uh, the question was, the question was, uh, totally believable character. She got into it and enjoyed his work and, and believed him completely. So how does that work? How does an actor do that, commit to a character like that with all the negative aspects of it? How do you then go home? What do you do? What's the process like? How do you, you don't want to take this character home with you. No, not at all. And so, yeah, when I would get home, I did, on the drive home, sometimes we shoot an hour outside of New York City and I would drive back and I would feel really, really guilty and kind of just sleazy because it's such a sleazy world and character and you're surrounded by the planes and that, you know, it all feels very real. It's big, you know, yachts and things like that. And so when I'd go home, I would, I would either hang out or call some friends from, from high school or college and some were in New York City or my parents or siblings and then, um, I would watch things that were just really light. I would just watch like really light films or television. Um, I tried to watch Breaking Bad. I swear to you, I swear to you. I tried to and I couldn't watch it at that time because I didn't want to go to you know any, some, any 
form of a dark place at, during that time period. I had to wait till I was in a really good headspace to watch the rest of Breaking Bad because I didn't want to, you know, because I had to, it was so intense and wonderful. And uh, uh, so I would watch really light things like, you know, The Simpsons or something just, 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 just joyous and bright and, you know, like almost innocent. Now, like, when you called your friends to come over and watch a movie with you, did you do it like, hi, this is Jordan, you want to? Come over and watch a movie with me? Or did you go with Donnie? Hey, yo, get over here. We'll watch another movie. I mean, there, there are certain aspects that you, to get into the character, you kind of wear him a little bit, right? And see what it's like. Yeah. Um, public, I think, you, you get a little bravado going, right? That was, that. honestly, you had to really go, like, you had to check yourself really hard on the way home. You're like, no one cares about you outside of work. You know, like, you can't, like, talk to people in that way or... You know, like you're you're not like that. And what was the most interesting was when it ended, when the film ended, like we wrapped the film because I spent six months around my hero and I got so sad because it was like I was there for six and a half months with this guy I I worship. And when it ended, I, any actor, you know, you you know this feeling when you end something. The day after it ends, you're like, Depressed. what do I do? Yeah. yeah, like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know, am I ever gonna see him again? Like, you know, like, I felt so sad because I just miss Scorsese so much and, and um, Throwing pebbles at his window. Yeah, it's like, Martin, like, when do I call, Martin. like, do I wait a few months to call him and say hi, you know, like. Uh, it's like you're dating him, you know? Yeah, I was just so, so like, nervous and then, yeah, and then I, I got I got bummed when it ended because I just I I enjoyed as crazy as the experience was. It was the most challenging and fulfilling thing I've ever done. You know. Well, that's a perfect place to end it. Um, a, a magnificent performance. Thank you. You deserve all the accolades that are coming toward you. Thank you so much for being here today. They appreciate it. We appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank so you much. all for coming. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks to Good night. Thank you.